Uh, I first became aware of our next speaker um, reading mountain goat literature. I'm a, a big fan of the mountain goat and uh, this particular individual was publishing lots of interesting papers on mountain goats and then he uh, switched over and moved to Quebec and um, started working on caribou and I was really excited to see uh, what he'd be doing and um, he's over the last decade probably been the most productive uh, scientist uh, forming uh, caribou on Gava and just putting out scores and scores of really important scientific papers. Uh, please welcome Steve Cote. He's going to be talking about climate change. Well, thanks a lot, Kai. That's an impressive introduction. I wasn't too nervous, but I am now. <laughs> Especially that I see, uh, it's always a problem when you sit in the front, you don't know how many people are there in the back. So, so thank you for the introduction and uh, mainly thank you for inviting me uh, here. It's a great opportunity uh, to be here and I really, uh, really appreciate it. And uh, what I want to do today is um, to talk about the ecology in general of, uh, of Arctic ungulates, and I will emphasize mainly uh, population dynamics because I think that's uh, a very important theme and something that uh, everybody here is interested in, like what are driving the changes in numbers of these animals, and uh, we always talk about that. So I'll use examples of the work we've been doing at Caribou and Gava, which is a, a group we created a number of years ago, interested in the population dynamics of uh, mainly of migratory caribou. And, uh, but I chose a number of uh, pretty uh, broad examples, and I don't want to go into details of each of them today. I want to show a variety, a diversity of examples and hopefully generate discussion. So if you're interested in some of the things I mentioned, please come talk to me about it. But not just me, like I've listed a number of people there, students and scientists at the Quebec government and also other scientists in different universities. There's a number of them uh, that are here today and uh, make sure you talk to them. You don't have to talk to me about these things. And uh, they've done a lot of this work. Obviously, I couldn't do this uh, myself. And there's a big collaborative uh, effort in there. And I'm very fortunate um, that we have uh, this group uh, back east. Like, uh, everybody is working together and was uh, very volunteer to embark on this project on, uh, improving our knowledge about, uh, about mainly migratory caribou, but I'll talk a little bit about muskox also uh, today. So the first thing I want to do, and Anne already uh, talked about some of these things, and uh, I always start with that for uh, maybe some of the younger members in the audience or those that have never been to a caribou conference um, before, about some of the context um, that um, is inspiring our study. So uh, we had some great introductions this morning, uh, especially from the Wilderness Society president. I really appreciated that. Uh, and um, that we all convinced that caribou or Arctic ungulates are a very important resource economically and scientifically because uh, we've known that. But they're also even more important culturally for a lot of people and it's something that is different uh, as opposed to mountain goats, for instance, and other species of ungulates that sometimes we forget, but we're not allowed to forget that for, for caribou. So it's, it's very important for culturally also. And Anne mentioned that, but the rapid changes in distribution and, uh, and the very constructed population dynamics we've seen are, makes this species very interested, or these group of species very interested. But I always make the point that the overabundance that we've seen in the past is no guarantee of uh, we will see that in the future. Like those that know me uh, knows that I don't want to use the work cycle for caribou, and I don't think it's a relevant question now. Maybe it will be in 180 years when we have more data uh, for that. But we've known that they've been to very, very low numbers in the past, but maybe not as low as we are now. 
And the habitat was very different than it is now with all the industrial change and the climate change. So there's no guarantee for that for the future, and that's why we have concerns about the possible and also demonstrated impacts of industrial development and of climate change. And that gives the context of these studies and why we're doing that and what are uh, the constraints uh, we have to deal with. So I'll go very quick with that. We all know this map. And Anne was a little bit more optimistic, which is great to hear. But globally, uh, for caribou, we see a global decline of caribou and reindeer throughout the circumpolar. And uh, the situation was a little bit different for uh, muskox, but it seems to be a getting uh, uh, not as good as it was. A number of populations were increasing, but uh, now we've started to see declines, especially of the very important populations in, uh, like on Victor Island and Banks Island, for instance. And there's a number of uh, unknown things, especially on the Greenland side and also in, on the Russian side of populations that we don't really know if they're increasing or not. So I think the global situation is we're still dealing with a situation where Arctic ungulates are more decreasing than anything else, and uh, that's why we're all concerned, and it's probably why we started from like 50 people going at the North American Caribou Workshop when I started to 600. So there's a really big increase in the number of people concerned uh, about caribou and, and muskox as well. <clears throat> so briefly now, uh, like, not surprisingly, I'll talk mainly about what I know, so the herds that we have uh, in Quebec, and already introduced them, so I'll be talking mainly about two main herds. Uh, see if these are working here. Uh, the Leaf River herd here on the western side and the Jaws River herd, and also two herds of uh, muskox, like one on the Hangava Bay here and one along the Hudson Bay coast. So these animals are migratory, uh, not the muskox, they're very sedentary, but the caribou are. Uh, the Leaf River herd is doing very long migration, perhaps the longest on the planet right now, like eight, 900 kilometers between the winter range in the taiga, open forests, up to uh, the summer ranges in the tundra. Uh, the George River herd used to be a very, like, do long migrations. They still migrate a little bit, but with the range contraction that Anne mentioned, uh, they've decreased a lot also their, their migratory behavior. So you have an animation here of, uh, it's just to show you uh, all these animals are moving. So you have mainly the females in green here and the males in blue. And you see them now moving uh, quite long distance in uh, their calving range, summer range. They don't stay there very long. They're already migrating down now back to the summer range. And in some years, as you can see now, they can, back, can be back all together and use a very, a very small portion of, uh, of, the, of their uh, of the territory uh, of Nunavik um, for a certain period of time. So they're highly migratory, and uh, <clears throat> we're fortunate to have these data, and that's where I take the opportunity to uh, thank the Quebec government for that. I think they initiated, to my knowledge, the, the most, uh, well, probably the oldest monitoring program we have with caribou. Like you see the numbers there, they're very impressive, like over a thousand animals that were equip equipped with satellite collars, and it's been going on since the late 80s. So that's the main base of data that we've been using at Caribou and Gava, along with other data, to, to uh, answer um, some of the questions I'll be talking about uh, today. I'll go very quick on that one. Anne already mentioned it. Um, it's already easy for me to convince people that it's interesting to work on these herds because the George River herd, uh, when I started uh, to work on these animals in 1991, they were the most abundant herd of the planet uh, with over 800,000 animals. They've, de they've decreased 99.5% or so to just a few thousand individuals uh, in, uh, in a very recent time. Like, I'm not that old, so I've seen that. Hopefully, I'm not related to that. But um, we've seen this very, very sharp decline in, uh, in about 30 years, or even less than 30 years. And the Leaf River herd has also decreased, uh, although to uh, a lesser extent. Like, it's out of context. An 80% decline seems a lot, but we always compare it to the George River. So things always look better for the Leaf River, but they've also decreased uh, quite a bit. So in this context, I've uh, listed a number of questions uh, that we've been asking at Kiribungaba over, over the recent years. And um, 
I'll use examples of some of these questions uh, today in the talk, like talking about population dynamics, but also life history traits that influence population dynamics, habitats, which habitats are important, when and why, how other animals start to play uh, also in, uh, in the context of caribou. We started to work only in caribou, but we introduce muskox, we introduce wolves and bear studies to see how they interact with caribou. And also we've looked obviously at industrial development and, and climate change. And there's a diagram here <clears throat> that some of you may have seen. That's the, I call it the workflow of caribou and gaba two. Like uh, we've just finished the second phase of research with caribou and gaba. And the central theme has always been population dynamics of migratory caribou, but each box that you see uh, is uh, a project that's been conducted by uh, a grad student. So there's an army of grad students that have been working on these studies. And uh, all these questions relate to this same questions of explaining what's driving the changes in numbers. So it could be changes in movements, as you see there, long-term changes in space use, anthropogenic disturbance, life history, predation, competition with like other ecotypes of caribou, changes in the habitat like climate change and effects on snow and rain and, and whatever on the habitat. There's also a, a genetic diversity that I've outlined there. We've done quite a bit of work on that. So obviously, um, I don't have time to talk about all of these. I think I have former students or current students here that can talk about any of these boxes. So make the effort to track them down if you want to discuss some of these topics. I've put some in blue, which are those that I will give you a brief example in the next few minutes. And I, again, I invite you to, co to come talk to me in more details about that or others in my group. So I start with survival. Um, not to be depressing because the survival values of these herds are quite low, but I think it's the best example we have in the literature of the importance of female survival as a life history trait that's driving population size. And you have here uh, results of a multi-state Bayesian model, quite complex model that one of my PhD students did and found that the, obviously the, the values for the Leaf River and the George River especially are quite low. Like I learned when I was a student, and when you have adult female survival that goes below 0.9, that you should be worried about your population. So if you look at the numbers uh, for the George, there's uh, not even a single point above 0.9, and you've got a lot of years uh, with survival that was like half of the female uh, dying. So no wonder when you have half of the females dying that these populations have plummeted and have decreased 99 uh, plus percent. So I think uh, these examples should be in textbook, especially the George River, and it's, it's an extremely good example of that. And as Anne mentioned, there's hope for recovery. You see the survival of these females have increased for the George River herd. Um, things have slowed down a little bit in recent years, but there's hope that uh, hopefully there will be a recovery. So continuing on survival, one thing I wanted to talk about that is a little bit newer is uh, although we've had information on survival of adults for a long time, uh, we didn't have much information on young individuals, on calves, and we did this study where we used camera colors uh, on females that we deployed in the winter on pregnant females, and we can follow them and know where they would give birth, and the video would start, and we could follow uh, the females during all summer and at the same time uh, see the calves on the video and uh, monitor survival uh, that way. So we were not too sure if it would be working. It does work. Uh, the rate of observation or the observation frequency of calves decrease uh, obviously through time. We don't see them uh, in the summer as often in the videos, but it doesn't matter, like we have a life history of them that is good enough that we can measure survival uh, during the first month, which was pretty good, and um, the survival uh, to first of September, so summer survival, which was about 0.63 uh, in our study for, um, for the leaf river herd calves. And then we tested a number of parameters that you see here. Uh, some of them related to climate change, habitat productivity, body mass of the mother, 
But the bottom line that we found is uh, although the bird season, the calving season is quite tight, uh, the main determinant of the survival of these calves was really uh, birth date. And as you can see on this graph, uh, it goes very, very quickly. If the animals are born a little bit later, their changes of survival uh, will decrease pretty fast. There was also a small effect of the mean temperature in the summer. Uh, and um, the best survival occurred when the temperature was average, too cold or too hot. Uh, doesn't seem to be good for calf survival. So then we move on with that information and calf survival. Uh, the reason why we did that was we wanted to build uh, more integrated population models that will integrate uh, calf survival. So the same uh, student, PhD student I had, Barbara, did some uh, an integrated population model looking at the, at the population dynamics with the objective of reconstructing the past population uh, dynamics of migratory caribou, but also assess the uh, ability of these populations to recover uh, in the near future. And uh, we, she did the models that I, I won't explain in details here, but we separated the age classes between calves, yearlings, and adults. And we used this Bayesian model uh, accounting for seasonal variation in survival and reproduction to, uh, to model population dynamics. And one uh, strength of this model, I would say, is that we try to include as many of the variables that managers commonly record, so the aerial survey estimates, the calf recruitment rate that are done in the fall, the winter pregnancy rate, and we also uh, work quite hard with the Quebec government and indigenous people to get in the number of harvested animals in the models, and uh, also uh, data on like habitat productivity and climate. And uh, the goal of that was to try to predict population size over the next 10 years using different harvest level simulations here and also using uh, what we call three uh, different scenarios. So the average scenario only represents its base and the average of every life history parameters that I just talked about. The pessimistic scenario means that uh, we use the same distribution, but the 0.1 percentile of the distribution up to the lowest values we ever recorded. And the optimistic scenario, it's the opposite, like it's the 0.9 percentile of the distribution up to the highest values we ever recorded for these, uh, these parameters. And then, don't be shocked, the next one is a bit scary. Uh, Barbara did it. so. It's quite simple, to be honest. So what we've done is basically what I just said, is we follow the survival of calves through the different seasons. Same for yearlings and adults. We took into account reproduction in the system. We use the sex ratio in the populations that is done during the fall classification. And the aerial survey data, the harvest data, and uh, we all threw that basically in the Bayesian model. And I'll give you an example if it's working or not. If it wouldn't be working, I wouldn't be showing it, obviously. So uh, that's the data for the George River. And you see that you have the aerial surveys that are done by the Quebec and the Newfoundland government and the predictions of the model. And it seems to be working pretty good. I'll zoom out on the, here the last period. And you see that the model fit is, uh, is pretty good. That's interesting, but the main objective for that, again, was to try to see what's going to happen in the next few years. Do, are we going to see a recovery of this herd or other herds? And the situation is perhaps, but do not celebrate too quickly. Uh, the model is showing that if things don't change and stay like they are, we will continue a decline up to uh, the next few years. Obviously, the pessimistic scenario is going to be a bad thing, too. But there is some hope, as Anne mentioned. If we take the optimistic scenario, that means that if we, if we change to very high survival rate, which is what we're seeing right now for adult females and good reproduction, um, then maybe we could have a recovery of, uh, of this herd. So, but that's interesting to remember that only one of the scenario allows that. If things continue as they are today, uh, it's likely that we're going to see a decrease um, again in these populations. If you're interested in seeing the graph for the Leaf River, because it's still work that is not published, track me down, please. 
So that's the same slide I just showed about the examples of uh, some of the questions. Uh, I just wanted to give some examples also on, uh, on habitat and, uh, and uh, migration routes. So this is one example that I really like about the spring migration of the Leaf River herd. You see that's just a Brownian bridge model with hot spots in red here of the migration of these animals. <coughs> Quite often we think of migration routes that, okay, they're going here, it's just like a highway like mule deer do in Wyoming, they go in one place every year. Uh, it's quite different with caribou and they change their migration every year. You'll see in some years it's pretty clear, like here and here. In some of the years it's a lot more diffuse and they use very, very broad migration uh, routes. So that makes it interesting but also quite complex because if you're a land planner and you want to make sure you preserve the habitat for, to allow the caribou migration. That makes a big difference if you have to protect a corridor that is 50 kilometers wide or 500 kilometers wide. And down, for example, block it with a road uh, in the middle. So we found using the GPS tracks of caribou females that, of course, caribou selected tundra and av avoided water forests and higher elevations during their migration. But one of the main things we found over the years is that uh, there was a, quite a big impact of climate change and high precipitations uh, in rain under the, or snow uh, really delayed the migration of the caribou and sometimes caused them to even give birth before they, uh, they could reach the calving ground. So we can expect with changes in precipitations with climate change to see uh, impacts on, uh, on the migration of, uh, of caribou during the same period. And with these changes in, uh, of high precipitations on, uh, on the migration, we also see a trend for animals to start their spring migration earlier as the year comes on. This is uh, work that we've published a number of years ago, but the trend is continuing that um, because perhaps of changes in the weather conditions, caribou have to change and start uh, to do their migration uh, earlier. And it can also change, uh, because of climate change, the use of their winter range. So that figure is a bit complex. But what I want you to see on that, that was work that was done by one of my former PhD students, that uh, the choice of the winter range may change. Like if you see the animals here in blue means that they stay in the tundra during the winter. And in green, it means that uh, they do a migration between the tundra and the forest taiga in the winter time. And uh, those in the middle are like uh, mixed, like intermittent behavior. So you see that these things have changed through time, and they're doing a much longer migration now than they, than they used to be. And the main determinants of that, I talk about climate change or temperature, especially during the migration I had just alluded to, like especially in December, temperatures and precipitation but also the size of other neighboring populations. So in the case of the Leaf River herd, they started to do this uh, taiga migration when the George River herd decreased, just like they have now the, all the space they wanted, like the George River stopped to use the western hand of the peninsula, and then they could start to do this migration between the taiga and, and, um, and the tundra. But also, uh, like as I said, strong influence of uh, of climate drivers during uh, the migration uh, and uh, yeah, during the migration and just before the migration. One other thing related to habitat that I think is interesting and, uh, and uh, has a hopeful message in there is that caribou by their numbers could affect the productivity of the habitat. Again, that's a complex figure, but these are all decreasing curves showing that when caribou density is increasing, no matter the time lag you look at, uh, you will see uh, a decrease in the productivity of their calving grounds and the summer range. But what we could see with satellite images, you can see here, is when you correct the productivity of habitat and you remove the signal of climate change, which with increasing temperature, you could see that the habitat is improving uh, when the populations of caribou have gone down. So these are data for the George River herd. So we see the caribou have an impact on habitat productivity, but we also we can also see through satellite images the recovery that is quite quick and quicker than we expected of the habitat. And there's hope that uh, this habitat will be uh, productive enough to allow uh, population to increase again. 
So I'll go quick, but I wanted to talk also about other drivers, a little bit, a uh, small word about predation and, uh, and competition. I said I will talk about muskox. Um, so we have to introduce muskox populations in Quebec, and we discussed that at the muskox, MuxNet meeting yesterday. Um, we have just did a study of the potential of competition between caribou and muskox. Uh, the two muskox populations are here in red and in, uh, in blue here. Uh, so the bottom line is that there were few potential for, vol for competition in our study because there's a low spatial overlap between the two. And the probability of occurrence, of co-occurrence, is quite low. What you see on these maps, if it's purple, it means that the probability of co-occurrence with caribou is quite low. And if it's like uh, when it's a paler color, the probability is high. But overall, uh, the co-occurrence between the two spatially was quite low. But the diet they're eating was relatively similar. So you have winter, late winter, spring, and summer diet here of caribou and muskox right next to each other. And you can see a lot of similarities between the, boat, between, uh, the, two, the two species. Uh, and uh, that's uh, non-dimensional like scaling here. And you see that uh, like one species is mainly contained, like the caribou is contained within the muskox uh, diet. So that means that uh, well, at least in Quebec, where the spatial overlap is quite low, if there are uh, a potential for competition, it, uh, it's likely uh, going to be through the diet. But it would be interesting, as I mentioned like yesterday in, in the MuxNet group, to, to look at this competition like, uh, in, uh, in situations where the overlap between the two is a lot higher, uh, like on Victoria Island, for instance. A word about um, predation. Um, and this slide is not going to change because it's too heavy. So we've started in 2011 uh, in collaboration with the Quebec government and Newfoundland government to also look at the role of predators. And we've equipped a number of wolves. And you see tracks here all over Nunavik and also of, of black bears. And that was new to me to work on these ungulates. And uh, we've learned interesting things. Uh, I also have an animation here, hopefully it's working, where you're going to see uh, all species together. So the caribou are in purple, uh, the bears are in black, obviously not moving, and the wolves are in red. And uh, you could see that we have migratory caribou, but we also have sedentary wolves, but also migratory wolves uh, that will uh, migrate with the caribou, and you'll see them, they will be following them all the way in their winter range like really tracking them. And that's impressive to see this animation. Like, don't forget that there's, like, there's a thousand kilometers between here and here. So that's very, very long distance. And a very dynamic system where the caribou, uh, the wolves, and the bears are, are integrated. I'll go quite fast here, but we've done a number of work on like um, wolf stomachs and uh, bear stomachs uh, we use at DNA fingerprints, and we use uh, stable isotopes. And no surprisingly, we found that wolves eat a lot of caribou. Uh, we wanted to, to make, so that's 85, 87, 88 percent of their diet, especially in the winter time. A little bit less if you include also the summertime. They will eat other things. So that was no big surprise that the wolves were using a lot of the caribou. But we wanted to know also the contribution of bears. And we found in the spring diet during the calving, that the caribou contribution to bear diet is lower than expected, like it's about 8% of their diet that is uh, made of caribou. Still a, a significant number, but not as high as expected. But the interesting thing is when you move towards the range of caribou, like this is the latitude here in Quebec, and you'll see that their uh, the signature is increased in nitrogen. So that means they have a higher trophic level and they eat, they're more carnivorous than bears that are down south. So this is... Um, Something related again to um, uh, probably to predation on uh, on caribou, especially uh, during early spring. Other types of questions I mentioned: the cumulative impacts or the impacts of climate change and industrial development. I at least wanted to show one slide that come from uh, the PhD of Sabrina that is here uh, today too, that looks at the cumulative impacts of industrial disturbance. So we've looked at the impacts of mining, of mining exploration, of roads, of human settlements, of power lines. 
And basically what she found is that the zone of influence of these structures was quite high, especially for some uh, disturbance like the mine, for instance. So that means that they can influence caribou up to like 20, 23 kilometers. And when you have hunting, uh, now we don't have hunting in Nunavik and uh, Nunatsiavut, but we used to. And when you include sport hunting, what happens is that these uh, distances just increase, uh, bec likely because the caribou are more stressed. And when you relate that to cumulative habitat loss, you find out that in certain years, it could, uh, in certain season, especially if there's hunting, it could represent up to 30% of the total area of good habitat that is lost due to cumulative disturbance. Obviously, she took like five years to show that. I spent 30 seconds talking about that. So we can uh, continue the discussion of the details of that uh, if you're interested. I want to conclude because I want to have time for questions about uh, uh, three main things. Um, obviously, uh, we think that there's several factors, uh, and I've listed some of them here, that are important to look at and to understand population dynamics. We don't have a good understanding of all of them. Otherwise, I will retire and I won't be there to uh, say that we're going to continue working on that. And. Um, there's the next phase of caribou and gaba just coming up. I'm really excited about that, the, what we call the phase three, and I'll give you an overview of that in a few seconds. So I think there are still things that we need to work on. Uh, we believe there's some cumulative impacts of industrial development and climate change. We've shown some of them, and we will continue to work on that, as you will see in the next uh, graph in the future. And with the endangered status, or sometimes it's even worse than the endangered status of several populations of caribou and also of muskox, um, we need new management and conservation plans that will include critical habitats. And one of my students has a poster on that. She'll be really happy to talk to you about that. And I haven't talked a lot about, uh, I talked about aboriginal communities early in the talk, saying that um, caribou are very important culturally. But there's a big need to include uh, this type of knowledge also in, uh, in these management plans and conservation plans. And um, this is something I did not discuss because I'm not an expert of that. But obviously, I'll be very happy to talk about it uh, with you uh, if you are interested in, uh, in that. So this is a big uh, new thing for us. It's not even funded yet, but it, I'm supposed to get the answer this week. But I'm highly confident. So that's the framework for Caribou and Gava 3. So no big surprise, the population dynamics is still in the middle. But it's just to give you an overview of what will keep us busy in the next uh, six years or so. We've got a lot of different projects on caribou phenology, like, again, life history stuff. Uh, we want to uh, apply the IPM models we develop for smaller populations, including forest dwelling uh, boreal ecotype in there. Uh, still some work in genetics. I haven't talked about it much today, but uh, Joel will give a talk about the recent program we did on genetics, uh, I think tomorrow or day after tomorrow. So uh, you could go that, but we'll continue that. Critical habitat, as I mentioned, we continue the work on interactions with other species, work also with experiments on the habitat of caribou, and a number of other things, including industrial uh, development as well. So I'm sure there's at least one topic of this that is an interest for you, so you have no reason not to talk to, uh, to our team in the next, uh, next few days. And I'd like to end just by thanking the multiple uh, Caribou and Gaba partners. Uh, it costs a lot of money to do that, and we always appreciate their financial support, but also ideas and uh, help that they've been giving over the past. And we have a website, so it's very, very tough to remember. And, uh, I just type caribou and gava and you'll find us. So according to my watch, I have time for questions. So at least one. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, we we'll probably have time for one or two questions. Just raise your hand. We got a couple of people with handheld mics that can come uh, ask. Don't be bashful, there's only six hundred of you. Good morning. Over here. Uh, my name is Theodore Kacha. I'm a ranger herder owner 
of Stepan Salask. One of the things I, uh, my dad told me, and this was a year, many years ago, when I started herding reindeer, and uh, one of the things he told me that when the caribou and the uh, uh, reindeer are mixing, and uh, there's lots of wolf, the wolf will kill caribou and reindeer and only eat tongue. That's how some of the predation, predation uh, occur. So some of the things that not many people know about when there's a lot of caribou or wolves, they eat enough meat and then later on they start eating only tongue. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. <laughs> That's quite a common thing for caribou to return to, car for wolves to return to carcasses also if the number of animal is low, but uh, obviously there's some surplus killing occurring when the animals are abundant, so that well described. Other questions? Uh, just a quick one. So there is the box diagram for the initial ungodly caribou studies, a lot of similar boxes for the second phase that you're waiting on. I just wonder if, uh, are you going to repeat a lot of the pro protocols that were done when populations were high to when populations are so low to get some sense for the changing dynamics between that? Uh, yeah, yeah so some of the questions are, are ongoing. Like I haven't shown the map of the first caribou and gaba, I showed second and the third, but there's a continuity between the first, second, and third. And some of the current projects are projects we've wanted to do for a long time. So the data collection started sometimes in the early 80s, uh, early 90s, and is continuing now. So. Uh, we try to get these protocols as robust as possible so that we can continue uh, the monitoring through time. And we have lots of help. Like Caribou and Gaba is not just scientists from university, it's scientists also from the Quebec and Newfoundland government. So they're involved in that and they're doing the monitoring every year. And uh, one of the strength of Caribou and Gaba is not me marking my caribou and them doing the monitoring, is that using the same animals and the same protocols together so that it's this idea of continuity through time is, is really there. And um, so it's, it's a really good point and uh, we, we have that in mind for sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hi. Uh, thank you for this great presentation. I hope that my English is understandable. I don't sure. speak good English. Um, I have two things to know from you, like, we always talk about like you know just blaming the old. At the same time, if you look at the policy arena and even the, we are talking about this human disturbance that has an influence on the movement of old as well. So, what is your understanding? Should we blame the old and should the old, or we? need to focus on our behavior? Yeah, that's a good question. Like, obviously, I'm not here to blame anyone <laughs> or, or any factor. And our goal is try to integrate. Uh, that's what I've tried to outline in the last slide about cumulative impacts, like try to integrate different sources of information to, to uh, understand uh, what, dri what drove the changes in the past and what will drive them in the future. So obviously, in uh, where we are now, it's, it's an interesting period because um, we have know there's some natural phenomenon going on, like high numbers of caribou that imp are impacting the vegetation and natural processes. But these processes are also in interaction with the north that is changing with more exploration and more industrial development and hunting also. So we're trying to find the balance between all these factors and it's not an easy task, but uh, I don't want to like uh, point any special factor on that today. Thank you. One more? Last one. Okay, last one. So, um, through the season, <clears throat> body fat and body reserves and general 
reserves of animals vary in their contribution to uh, what happens with respect to the population dynamics. So from the high levels of uh, population down to the lowest levels, have you seen any change in body composition at times of the year, say, particularly in spring is what I was interested in? Yeah, I haven't uh, given much uh, details today on, on body composition, and as you know, we, we've done some work of that and, uh, in the past. And obviously, the caribou are really plastic, like several other ungulates, so they change uh, quite a bit in size through time. So uh, right now, when the population is at low density and is recovering, obviously for the George River, the animals are in much better condition than they were um, in the when when they were in the decline. Uh, <clears throat> but in terms of looking at specific body conditions uh, of the animals, we've done several uh, studies on that in the late well from 2007 and 2009 uh, during Joel's PhD, for instance. But uh, after that. Um, we stop these collections for like uh, ethical reasons. Uh, so we have the quality of data on body composition of animals post 2009, except one year in 2013, is quite low. So uh, one of the goal we have is to try to look at uh, like uh, indirect measures of these conditions that uh, uh, that will uh, that do not need to to kill the animals to get this information. So, but we could discuss that in more details for sure. Thanks, Steve. Just want to thank all of our presenters this morning. If you give them one last hand, I appreciate it.